Chapter Sixteen of the Blythedale Romance. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Blythedale Romance by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Chapter Sixteen. Leave Takings. A few days after the tragic passage at arms between Hollingsworth and me, I appeared at the dinner table actually dressed in a coat instead of my customary blouse, with a satin cravat, too, a white vest, and several other things that made me seem strange and outlandish to myself. As for my companions, this unwonted spectacle caused a great stir upon the wooden benches that bordered either side of our homely board. "'What's in the wind now, Miles?' asked one of them. "'Are you deserting us?' "'Yes, for a week or two, said I. "'It strikes me that my health demands a little relaxation of labor "'and a short visit to the seaside during the dog days.' "'You look like it,' grumbled Silas Foster, "'not greatly pleased with the idea of losing an efficient laborer "'before the stress of the season was well over.' "'Now here's a pretty fellow. "'His shoulders have broadened a matter of six inches since he came among us. "'He can do his day's work, if he likes, with any man or ox on the farm, "'and yet he talks about going to the seashore for his health. "'Well, well, old woman,' added he to his wife, "'let me have a plateful of that pork and cabbage. "'I begin to feel in a very weakly way. "'When the others have had their turn, "'you and I will take a jaunt to Newport or Saratoga.' "'Well, but, Mr. Foster,' said I, "'you must allow me to take a little breath.' "'Breath,' retorted the old yeoman, "'your lungs have the play of a pair of blacksmith's bellows already. "'What on earth do you want more? "'But go along. "'I understand the business. "'We shall never see your face here again. "'Here ends the reformation of the world, "'so far as Miles Coverdale has a hand in it.' "'By no means,' I replied. "'I am resolute to die in the last ditch for the good of the cause.' "'Die in a ditch,' muttered gruff Silas, with genuine Yankee intolerance of any intermission of toil, except on Sunday, the 4th of July, the autumnal cattle show, Thanksgiving, or the annual fast. "'Die in a ditch? I believe in my conscience you would if there were no steadier means than your own labor to keep you out of it.' The truth was that an intolerable discontent and irksomeness had come over me. Blythedale was no longer what it had been. Everything was suddenly faded. The sunburnt and arid aspect of our woods and pastures beneath the August sky did but imperfectly symbolize the lack of dew and moisture that since yesterday, as it were, had blighted my fields of thought, and penetrated to the innermost and shadiest of my contemplative recesses. The change will be recognized by many who, after a period of happiness, have endeavored to go on with the same kind of life in the same scene, in spite of the alteration or withdrawal of some principal circumstance. They discover, what heretofore perhaps they had not known, that it was this which gave the bright color and vivid reality to the whole affair. I stood on other terms than before, not only with Hollingsworth, but with Zenobia and Priscilla. As regarded the two latter, it was that dreamlike and miserable sort of change that denies you the privilege to complain, because you can assert no positive injury, nor lay your finger on anything tangible. It is a matter which you do not see, but feel, and which, when you try to analyze it, seems to lose its very existence and resolve itself into a sickly humor of your own. Your understanding, possibly, may put faith in this denial, but your heart will not so easily rest satisfied. It incessantly remonstrates, though most of the time in a bass note which you do not separately distinguish, but now and then with a sharp cry, importunate to be heard, and resolute to claim belief. Things are not as they were, it keeps saying. You shall not impose on me. I will never be quiet. I will throb painfully. I will be heavy and desolate and shiver with cold. For I, your deep heart, know when to be miserable, as once I knew when to be happy. All is changed for us. You are beloved no more. 
and were my life to be spent over again i would invariably lend my ear to this cassandra of the inward depths however clamorous the music and the merriment of a more superficial region my outbreak with hollingsworth though never definitely known to our associates had really an effect upon the moral atmosphere of the community it was incidental to the closeness of relationship into which we had brought ourselves that an unfriendly state of feeling could not occur between any two members without the whole society being more or less commoted and made uncomfortable thereby this species of nervous sympathy though a pretty characteristic enough sentimentally considered and apparently betokening an actual bond of love among us was yet found rather inconvenient in its practical operation mortal tempers being so infirm and variable as they are if one of us happened to give his neighbor a box on the ear the tingle was immediately felt on the same side of everybody's head thus even on the supposition that we were far less quarrelsome than the rest of the world a great deal of time was necessarily wasted in rubbing our ears musing on all these matters i felt an inexpressible longing for at least a temporary novelty i thought of going across the rocky mountains or to europe or up the nile of offering myself a volunteer on the exploring expedition of taking a ramble of years no matter in what direction and coming back on the other side of the world then should the colonists of blithedale have established their enterprise on a permanent basis i might fling aside my pilgrim staff and dusty shoon and rest as peacefully here as elsewhere or in case hollingsworth should occupy the ground with his school of reform as he now purposed i might plead earthly guilt enough by that time to give me what i was inclined to think the only trustworthy hold on his affections meanwhile before deciding on any ultimate plan i determined to remove myself to a little distance and take an exterior view of what we had all been about in truth it was dizzy work amid such fermentation of opinions as was going on in the general brain of the community it was a kind of bedlam for the time being although out of the very thoughts that were wildest and most destructive might grow a wisdom holy calm and pure and that should incarnate itself into the substance of a noble and happy life but as matters now were i felt myself and having a decided tendency towards the actual i never liked to feel it getting quite out of my reckoning with regard to the existing state of the world i was beginning to lose the sense of what kind of a world it was among innumerable schemes of what it might or ought to be it was impossible situated as we were not to imbibe the idea that everything in nature and human existence was fluid or fast becoming so that the crust of the earth in many places was broken and its whole surface portentously upheaving that it was a day of crisis and that we ourselves were in the critical vortex our great globe floated in the atmosphere of infinite space like an unsubstantial bubble no sagacious man will long retain his sagacity if he live exclusively among reformers and progressive people without periodically returning into the settled system of things to correct himself by a new observation from that old standpoint it was now time for me therefore to go and hold a little talk with the conservatives the writers of the north american review the merchants the politicians the cambridge men and all those respectable old blockheads who still in this intangibility and mistiness of affairs kept a death grip on one or two ideas which had not come into vogue since yesterday morning the brethren took leave of me with cordial kindness and as for the sisterhood i had serious thoughts of kissing them all around but forbore to do so because in all such general salutations the penance is fully equal to the pleasure so i kissed none of them and nobody to say the truth seemed to expect it 
"'Do you wish me,' I said to Zenobia, "'to announce in town and at the watering-places "'your purpose to deliver a course of lectures "'on the rights of women?' "'Women possess no rights,' said Zenobia, "'with a half-melancholy smile. "'Or at all events only little girls and grandmothers "'would have the force to exercise them.' She gave me her hand freely and kindly, and looked at me, I thought, with a pitying expression in her eyes. Nor was there any settled light of joy in them on her own behalf, but a troubled and passionate flame, flickering and fitful. "'I regret on the whole that you are leaving us,' she said, "'and all the more since I feel that this phase of our life is finished, and can never be lived over again.' "'Do you know, Mr. Coverdale, that I have been several times on the point of making you my confidant, for lack of a better and wiser one? But you are too young to be my father confessor, and you would not thank me for treating you like one of those good little handmaidens who share the bosom secrets of a tragedy queen.' "'I would at least be loyal and faithful,' answered I, "'and would counsel you with an honest purpose, if not wisely.' Yes, said Zenobia, you would be only too wise, too honest. Honesty and wisdom are such a delightful pastime at another person's expense. Ah, Zenobia, I exclaimed, if you would but let me speak. By no means, she replied, especially when you have just resumed the whole series of social conventionalisms, together with that straight-bodied coat. I would as lief open my heart to a lawyer or a clergyman, no no mr coverdale if i choose a counsellor in the present aspect of my affairs it must be either an angel or a madman and i rather apprehend that the latter would be the likeliest of the two to speak the fitting word it needs a wild steersman when we voyage through chaos the anchor is up farewell Priscilla, as soon as dinner was over, had betaken herself into a corner and set to work on a little purse. As I approached her, she let her eyes rest on me with a calm, serious look, for with all her delicacy of nerves there was a singular self-possession in Priscilla, and her sensibilities seemed to lie sheltered from ordinary commotion like the water in a deep well. "'Will you give me that purse, Priscilla?' said I, as a parting keepsake. "'Yes,' she answered, "'if you will wait till it is finished.' "'I must not wait even for that,' I replied. "'Shall I find you here on my return?' "'I never wish to go away,' said she. "'I have sometimes thought,' observed I, smiling, "'that you, Priscilla, are a little prophetess, "'or, at least, that you have spiritual intimations "'respecting matters which are dark to us grosser people. "'If that be the case, I should like to ask you "'what is about to happen, "'for I am tormented with a strong foreboding "'that were I to return even so soon as to-morrow morning "'I should find everything changed. "'Have you any impressions of this nature?' "'Ah, no,' said Priscilla, looking at me apprehensively. "'If any such misfortune is coming, the shadow has not reached me yet. Heaven forbid. I should be glad if there might never be any change, but one summer follow another, and all just like this.' "'No summer ever came back, and no two summers ever were alike,' said I, with a degree of Orphic wisdom that astonished myself." times change and people change and if our hearts do not change as readily so much the worse for us good-bye priscilla i gave her hand a pressure which i think she neither resisted nor returned priscilla's heart was deep but of small compass it had room but for a very few dearest ones among whom she never reckoned me on the doorstep i met hollingsworth I had a momentary impulse to hold out my hand, or at least to give a parting nod, but resisted both. When a real and strong affection has come to an end, it is not well to mock the sacred past with any show of those commonplace civilities that belong to ordinary intercourse. Being dead henceforth to him and he to me, there could be no propriety in our chilling one another with the touch of two corpse-like hands, or playing at looks of courtesy, with eyes that were impenetrable beneath the glaze and the film. 
We passed, therefore, as if mutually invisible. I can no wise explain what sort of whim, prank, or perversity it was that after all these leave-takings induced me to go to the pigsty and take leave of the swine. There they lay, buried as deeply among the straw as they could burrow, four huge black grunters, the very symbols of slothful ease and sensual comfort. They were asleep, drawing short and heavy breaths, which heaved their big sides up and down. Unclosing their eyes, however, at my approach, they looked dimly forth at the outer world, and simultaneously uttered a gentle grunt, not putting themselves to the trouble of an additional breath for that particular purpose, but grunting with their ordinary inhalation. They were involved and almost stifled and buried alive in their own corporeal substance. The very unreadiness and oppression wherewith these greasy citizens gained breath enough to keep their life machinery in sluggish movement appeared to make them only the more sensible of the ponderous and fat satisfaction of their existence. Peeping at me an instant out of their small, red, hardly perceptible eyes, they dropped asleep again, yet not so far asleep but that their unctuous bliss was still present to them betwixt dream and reality. "'You must come back in season to eat part of a spare-rib,' said Silas Foster, giving my hand a mighty squeeze. "'I shall have these fat fellows hanging up by the heels, heads downward, pretty soon, I tell you.' "'Oh, cruel Silas, what a horrible idea!' cried I. All the rest of us, men, women, and livestock, save only these four porkers, are bedeviled with one grief or another. They alone are happy, and you mean to cut their throats and eat them. It would be more for the general comfort to let them eat us, and bitter and sour morsels we should be. End of chapter 16